Oh. Hmm. Already and Hi everyone. I'm going to turn the lights down low. Oh, you found it right there. <laughs> because my background is in art history and I love these pretty pictures. Hi everyone, I'm Susan Navarre. I'm the executive director at the Fitchburg Historical Society. And I'm actually not originally from Fitchburg, but I've been having a lot of fun learning Fitchburg's history because it really is sort of a fascinating city. So I'm not even from New England. So on the one hand, it's a great way to uh, learn New England's culture. It seems to be typical of New England's culture and institutions. And you can learn a lot about the beginning of the Industrial Revolution at, in Fitchburg. It's on the Nashua River, which is part of the, um, <laughs> the Merrimack River. It's a tributary to the Merrimack. So it's also has always been filled with factories uh, since early days. Um, but on the other hand, Fitchburg seems to have some real idiosyncrasies of its own. This is one, one of my favorite pictures here. Um, so I decided that uh, I was asked to do a talk at Fitchburg State University uh, for the Women's History Month. And I thought that I would try to find a way to explore the lives of two different groups of women. Um, whose lives seem to be very different. Even though they were living side by side in Fitchburg, a relatively small New England city. Now my, my approach came partly out of my own family story. These are actually pictures of Fitchburg women. Um, but uh, in my own story, on one side, my mother is descended from the Welsh who were in the United States since the early 1700s. But then she's also descended from very recent Finnish immigrants. And on my dad's side, he's de descended on one side from very, re from very early French immigrants who came in the early 1700s. And on the other side, from re relatively recent uh, Irish and Swedish immigrants. So when I would read the early, the early days of women's history, of course they emphasized uh, women in the upper classes and the upper middle classes. And it sort of resembled my own history for me, but then it also didn't. So I thought, well, well working with these, these uh, primary sources at the Fitchburg Historical Society, I could see, I was going to look to see what I could find about working women's history as well. So I decided to use some of our resources at the Historical Society to try to recover women's lives from different backgrounds and try to consider them together. Um, because I was going to be speaking at Fitchburg State University and I knew it was going to be to undergrads, I really wanted to make it accessible to undergrads. And so to do that, my, I feel that my uh, methodology is a little bit experimental, uh, but I was hoping that it would give an interesting thought-provoking overview. And in this, in, in this context here, I was hope, I'm hoping that it will provide uh, some inspiration for, for further research. So our documents at the Fitchburg Historical Society uh, describe an agricultural community that's changing over to an industrial town after the first machine-powered factories started appearing along the Nashua River in the early 1800s. As many rural men and also immigrant, uh, immigrant men flocked to the city to work, that meant that there was also a new workforce of New England women who became available to work as servants, for example, in the homes of the factory owners and the managers. And uh, so as I read through our records, I realized that Fitchburg's native-born women, um, while having started as being fully employed with all of their responsibilities in the home between 1800 and 1850, uh, started to have those responsibilities taken over by servants, and that they were then able to do more and more outside of the home. So I haven't really found any documents yet that directly uh, document this process from going to a rural person who's uh, responsible for all of the work in the home individually to having servants. Um, but what I have been seeing as the result of this that there was a new kind of urban life that uh, 
developed around the factories, where affluent women had new opportunities for education and for new social activities. And so they, of course, become the pioneers of women's activism that uh, we learn about in the, in the descriptions of the women's movement. And uh, so in Fitchburg, most of the really pioneering women uh, whose stories I found dated from the late 1800s. But I thought I'd like to use one woman as a, as a preamble here. Uh, her Fitchburg story uh, shares elements uh, that I've seen throughout Fitchburg's history, common to everything. So I thought she's a great introduction. She has great religiosity. Um, she believes in the expansion of education and a desire to spread her own moral code. And uh, in fact, in Fitchburg, there were many, many uh, missionaries that they seem to be some of the most mobile and ambitious people in Fitchburg. We have some famous missionaries who went out to Hawaii, uh, very far away around the world. And uh, this woman is Sophia Sawyer. She was the daughter of poor farmers uh, in Fitchburg. Uh, she was born in 1792. She became a teacher. And um, almost right away, she applied to become a missionary teacher with the Cherokee Indians in uh, Tennessee and Georgia. After working there for a while, she moved further west, and she ended up uh, establishing the Fayetteville Female Seminary for the Cherokee in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And that was in 1839. So she's now actually considered one of the founding mothers of Arkansas. And I think that she's also a typical New England woman in many ways, shaped by her belief in both uh, religion and education. There we go. But of course, it's around 1850, uh, and especially after the Civil War, that we see wealth increase increasing exponentially in Fitchburg because of their success in industrial production and war production. And so we see the middle and upper classes expanding hugely, and that we see that the women there have more opportunities for increased education and travel. They have free time for social activities. And of course, there's the growth in, in social clubs and organizations. So the men and their family, Families uh, filled highly respected, powerful positions in the expanding economy. Uh, the children in their families generally could take advantage of many years of education. And what we saw in Fitchburg was that the women become paid professionals in more and more fields. So I see records of women who are novelists, journalists, architects, uh, educators. We've see, found some uh, inventors, also business owners. Uh, business owners both in the services but also in, in uh, industrial production too. So by the er early 20th century, we have Addie Gillette, who is the first woman admitted to the Worcester Bar. And uh, for any of you who write uh, historical fiction, I recommend her story. It seems like it would be a real bestseller. I'll just leave that, uh, that tease. It's Addie Gillette. Thank you. Sure. And uh, so then also from Fitchburg is Josephine Wright Chapman, who became one of the first women to study architecture at MIT. Uh, she was from Fitchburg. She's the uh, architect of the Craigie Arms, uh, where Craigie on Main is right now, um, among many other uh, buildings. Also, for those of you who know Worcester, she did the, uh, the Worcester Women's Club, which is now Tuckerman Hall. So you can see a certain similarity in the works that she does. They're very impressively built buildings. And uh, she's from Fitchburg. And her family, were, there are stories that her family did not encourage her. But actually, some of our historians feel that based on the, the family's history, that probably they actually did. And then Fitchburg also has one of uh, the few American art museums that was founded by a woman, by Eleanor Norcross. So of course, in the middle of the, of the 19th century, it was also the Civil War that was a watershed moment for women. Um, they, they were central, of course, in the abolitionist movement. The abolitionist movement was huge in Fitchburg. And um, they 
they did public activities like the anti-slavery fairs where they shared information about slavery and raised lots of money. And in Fitchburg in 1861, so very early, a school teach, a former school teacher, Susan Norcross, and her friends gathered in the town hall to start sewing things for the soldiers. They would sew sheets and flannel shirts, and they'd knit stockings for the soldiers. And um, it, within two months, they had actually created 1,500 different articles of clothing that they sent down to the soldiers. And then as the war continued, their group became known as the Fitchburg Ladies Soldier Aid Society, Soldiers Aid Society. And they started shipping monthly food parcels down to the front. And this group was actually uh, one of the most important that, that impressed, um, that inspired President Lincoln to form the Sanitary Commission, and they became uh, in, included within the Sanitary Commission and uh, continued with it, still locally organized and led by women. So though Susan Norcross, who had started this, died young soon after this, this is her daughter, Eleanor Norcross, who is uh, the professional artist who started the Fitchburg Art Museum. This is one of her paintings, actually, from when she was a child. Um, I, guess around eight years old that she did this particular painting. Um, she became not only a professional artist, but really a cultural arbiter for the city. She, she trained in the artist salons of Paris, and during her entire adult life, she split her time between Fitchburg and Paris. And, but she wanted to bring something of the culture from Paris to Fitchburg. So when she was in Fitchburg, she would hope uh, she would host a, a regular salon for people to learn more about the arts. And we see the, how it played out with many, many people doing more and more sophisticated art in the area. And again, she uh, provided the wherewithal for the art museum. And I highly recommend it if you haven't visited that art museum. They, they currently have a, a, a permanent, a semi-permanent uh, uh, collection about uh, Eleanor Norcross uh, of her work that's on view. So looking a, just a, at a couple more of the women that were this kind of sort of early pioneer in the 19th century that were specifically from Fitchburg, there were uh, two that I recently rediscovered, we found a little bit more of their work because of gifts that were given very recently to the Historical Society. And I became somewhat enamored of this one, of, of Mary Carolyn uh, Underwood, who was born in Fitchburg in 1839. She ultimately became a published writer under her married name, Mary Lowe Dickinson. So she started out by studying in the Fitchburg public schools. And at that time, according to what I've read, uh, they would get eight weeks of education in the summer and then eight weeks of education in the winter. But apparently she also sh uh, studied at home quite a bit because by the time she was 15, she was ready to become a teacher. Um, I'll mention one other thing that I discovered, that she was a Baptist, and when I was trying to get a sense of what her youth was like in the Baptist church there, I found some, some wonderful stories about what was happening in the local Baptist church in the 1830s. And there was actually a young member of the church that got into very serious trouble that they discussed and argued over for about five or six weeks because he or she went on a sleigh ride and then went to a ball. And this involved the entire congregation of the Baptist church to discuss this. And uh, then there were other members who went oh, to a circus. And so they were disciplined pretty, uh, pretty thoroughly by the church uh, that they couldn't go out at all anymore for quite a while because of going to a circus. Um, on the other hand, the uh, Baptist church in this area, I found in the records that they, uh, they adopted a resolution against slavery in 1838, and the historian writing about that felt that that was relatively late, and they had uh, also prohibited, uh, passed uh, regulations prohibiting any of their missionaries from owning slaves. So... Mary Carolyn started teaching when she was 15, and she mentioned that at this time, she was essentially a girl herself. This is not her, but I just thought this was a terrific uh, example of 
of a, a school group at this time. But she mentioned that as a, she was a girl herself when the way you became a teacher was that you had to undergo both written and oral exams before the school board. So she talks about standing in her short skirts before the school board and being peppered with questions uh, in order to become a teacher. And she passed, and so that meant that she became a teacher for a class of 70 elementary school students. So she was a good teacher, and a little later she moved to Boston uh, when she was 23 to become a, um, the head assistant at a larger school in Boston. And soon she was asked to become the assistant principal at the Hartford Female Seminary in Connecticut. And actually, she must have been a terrific teacher because later, when she was uh, an older woman close to death, her former students talked about putting together an alumni association for all of those who had ever studied with her. And she was a great student, too. She actually would tell the story for the rest of her life that when she was a kid in school, that one of her teachers accused her of copying her work out of a book. And she was so offended because this was her own, her own writing. Well, so after she was at the Hartford uh, Female Seminary, she was asked to, uh, to go to Vassar, uh, which was brand new at that time, in order to work at Vassar. But she de decided to decline. And instead, she decided to travel in Europe for a few years. And during that time, she was the European correspondent for the National Baptist newspaper, which was based in Philadelphia. And I think she may have gotten that job because actually the editor of the National Baptist newspaper um, had been the pastor at the First Baptist Church in Fitchburg for 10 years. His name was Kendall Brooks, and he's sort of an interesting Fitchburger, too, in that after being at Fitchburg's Baptist Church, he went down and edited the uh, National Baptist newspaper, and then he was called out to Kalamazoo, where he became the third president of Kalamazoo College. So, um, and if you want to read any of uh, Mary Carolyn's uh, writing at that time, it's actually, uh, the National Baptist is collected by the Boston Public Library and also the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester. Well, so she was, when she was in Europe, it seems she went out there mainly for the high culture, but we get some evidence that she was also influenced by all of the reform movements that were going on in, in England and Germany at the time. There were many, many women from New England that were going out to England and Germany because, of course, they had already industrialized. And so they were dealing with all sorts of terrible social problems, and they were starting to debate ways to fix those in a, you know, earlier than they were in the United States. So many uh, women who were wanting to uh, create positive social change were leaving Boston, other New England cities, to go out to Europe. So my impression is that, uh, that uh, Mary Carolyn went out there really for the literature, but ended up getting influenced by the reform movements. And part of that is uh, because of some of the uh, movements that she founded herself. So she ended up coming back to New York City and uh, she was going to uh, teach. And pretty soon she married a prominent New York City banker and stopped teaching and uh, just lived with him, lived a life uh, of a wealthy woman. But within a couple of years, her husband died. So as a widow, she threw herself into charity work. She gave lots of money away to the poor and especially to the education of women. But then with a couple, within a couple of years, she lost all of her money. I'm assuming that that was because one of the financial panics of the 1870s based on the time that I found. So then she had to go to work. Well, she had been giving a lot of money to the University of Denver as they were getting founded. So she was asked to come out and teach literature in Denver at the university. So she, start, she went out there to teach. She started writing poetry. And the poetry that she wrote is really, there, her image is that she's a wealthy, cultured, well-traveled woman with a little bit of a bohemian tendency. Um, for example, one of her most successful early poems was just always described, always described as having been written at the edge of the River Nile while she was using a soapbox for a desk. So coming back to women in soapboxes. So a little bohemian, very cultured. 
So ultimately, she did come back to New York from Colorado, and she made her living uh, editing magazines and writing and lecturing. And she was considered a very important thinker on, on religion, on ethics, and citizenship. I've got some of her titles, I won't go into all of them, but from girlhood to motherhood, uh, The Temptations of Catherine Gray, which I've actually heard of, but I think is a fun title too. So um, I would, I'd like to talk about one of the uh, texts that we received recently uh, from her. I was reading a lot of her essays that were in our, um, that we just received copies of recently. And I found one that was called Crushing the Pearls. It was published in the Home Magazine. And in it, she tells the story of an actress who's got to dance at the Palace Theater using some fake pearls. And uh, in an unlikely turn of events, her pearls, uh, she doesn't have her pearls, so she has to borrow some real pearls from a duchess who's in the audience. And then she, uh, starts to dance and the pearls promptly break. So that's the setup. And Dickinson writes, but the music still went on and the swift feet could make no pause. Think for a moment what it must have meant to go through the dance with every eye in the house watching and yet to guard her own steps that her foot should crush no single little pearl. I thought that was a wonderful description of anxiety and overcommitment, uh, even, even if it's a little dated now. And then she starts comparing modern this, this experience to modern life for young women. She says, there are too many of them moving through life as if it were the mazes of a giddy dance in which they would whirl faster and faster without heeding what pearls are being crushed beneath their feet. A little bit of a letdown because then she says, well, what are these pearls? And you know, we're thinking that they've lost their virginity. No, it's, they're, they're not praying enough. They've uh, forgotten purity and uh, kind words. But, but a terrific description. So she ends up becoming friends with two other Baptists, uh, two other women, uh, Mary Bonney of Philadelphia, Amelia Stone Quinlan of New York City. And they end up founding a group that's called the Women's National Indian Association. They found it in 1879, and it continues right on through till uh, 1951, uh, so nearly 100 years. She was their second president, and their goal was to Christianize Native Americans, but also to help them become full citizens and get their rights from the US government. Uh, they became a national organization that had chapters all over the United States, a very large organization. And uh, one of the senators that worked on Indian affairs, uh, Henry Dawes, said about them, the new government Indian policy was born of and nursed by this women's association. So she also became the director of a group called the International Order of the King's Daughters and Sons. She founded their magazine, and it became a, a platform for her, for her, um, for her, What's the word that I'm looking for? Her own um, writing and editing and for social improvement. I think that she's really a link between the pre-Civil pre -Civil War days and the modern world. She died in, at her home in Park Avenue in 1914. And her, her last visit to Fitchburg was in 1902. And she wrote a poem for Old Home Week in Fitchburg. She reflects on Fitchburg's modernity and she says, the brisk New England village and the country town of yore to memory's tear-dimmed vision is found, alas, no more. But then she celebrates. She says, the heart of this new city holds the heart of that old place and the whirling will, excuse me, and the whirling wheels of business that control the river's course, that rest from wind and lightning, their mighty secret force. So for the undergrads, I thought it was particularly interesting to contrast um, what Mary Lowe Dickinson's language was like and the language that Senator Dawes used. Because of course, you see, he said that they were giving birth to and nursing the American Eng uh, Indian policy. And meanwhile, Dickinson celebrates the whirling wheels of business, the mighty secret force of industry, and also the giddy and swift dance of, of young women. <clears throat> 
So one other writer that was published in Fitchburg that we just received this magazine, um, published in Fitchburg uh, in, 1890, in 1891, is um, Clara Dixon Davidson. And I, I looked her up to see if she was local. I can't find anything about her biography other than some uh, feminists from the uh, eight, 1980s and 90s were studying her work and they said that she was basically an individualist anarchist feminist and they link her with the Grimke sisters and with Lucretia Mott. And so apparently she was published in a number of uh, other anarchist, organ uh, anarchist publications in um, Boston. Uh, in New York, she's actually published in the North American Review and the Overland Monthly. So the poem that I found here on the front page of this uh, Fitchburg paper is called Cage Life, and it's addressed to a bird trapped in a cage. The bird's name is Frank. Um, ultimately, little Frank is set free, and he decides never to return to the cage. He says, would it so greatly matter to be dead, but better death than living in a cage? Well, so as I say, so far, I don't know much about her other than she is considered a feminist writer, uh, perhaps a very an anarchist linked one. Um, I thought it was particularly interesting that she's published in this Fitchburg paper that has a lot of local pub, uh, local poets uh, written uh, writing in it. Also has Edward Bellamy is published there. So these just came through the door for such a tiny city. It's interesting to see that this is part of the talk that's going that's going on. It does make some sense because by the 1890s we're seeing that the suffrage issue is is really front and center. It's being written about in the papers and the editorials. I was mentioning to somebody before this talk that they actually referred to this as the feminist question in eight, the 1890s, which I thought was really quite surprising. So now I'd like to come to the other side where I, where I compare uh, the lives of these women to the lives of first generation immigrants living in Fitchburg uh, during the same period of, of great transition uh, and growth of the city. It became a uh, majority minority city by 1905. So actually we've got the, uh, you can see the population here and I'd like to point out that, so you've got 1870 right after the Civil War and the, the population of Fitchburg. And then you see it go rocketing upward. And that's because of the, in, the increased number of factories and industrial production. And so actually the, the factory owners in Fitchburg, as in so many places, are sending people to the Boston docks to try to uh, get more people from Ireland and Scotland and other countries to hop on the train and go straight to Fitchburg. And they're sending people all across Canada to find more workers to come to Fitchburg. And so it starts to, to uh, level out by 1910, 1920. But uh, as I say, by 1905 or 1910, you've got 75% of Fitchburg's residents are either foreign born or the children of the foreign born. So of course it's, oh, let's see, that's, um, oh, sorry, I was skipping ahead a little bit here. Um, so I wanted to say this, there are some ways in which Fitchburg is unusually, uh, unusual as an early industrial city, that it was a city, it's 40 or 50,000 people, it's not a small town or village. So in some ways it's a much more diverse city than smaller towns than, that we think of as being mill towns. Also, it had a broad, broad diversity of immigrant groups that settled in Fitchburg. And also it had a broad diversity of industries. It wasn't just a, a textile town. It wasn't just finished, finished clothing. It wasn't only shoes. There were many, many, many different things that were being made there. And this is showing the normal school. Uh, there, it was also an education center. It's now, this is now Fitchburg State. This was a set up very early. So it's a, also a commercial, a publishing, and an educational center. And then one of the things that's sort of unusual is that the mill owners and the workers all lived close to each other in the same city. Uh, their lives seemed to really overlap. They were very aware of each other. Uh, I wonder if it's because it's a hilly city. So you've got people living down at the, uh, 
near the river. And of course, if you own a mill, you're up the, up the hills just slightly. But the areas that are the hills themselves stay rural and agricultural um, in, during Fitchburg's history. You've really got everybody living quite close together. The business owners are walking through their uh, workers' neighborhood in order to get to the, to the factory themselves. Let's do that. And we've been getting more and more new resources about the different immigrant groups. Our, say 50 or 60 years ago, we turned them all away, is my understanding. But now uh, generational shifts are happening, and we are receiving so much information about the 20th century immigrants. And it's all different kinds. I'm sort of looking at apples and oranges when I look at the history of the different immigrant groups. So of course, it's the workers that fuel uh, Fitchburg's factories, the underpinnings of all of the wealth there. And the earliest workers in the factories, of course, came off the farms, moving to the cities from the farms. And this is actually an image of the scythe makers at the scythe factory early in Fitchburg's history. Um, but then as, as uh, manufacturing grows and grows and grows, there's a labor shortage, just as there is in so much of New England. And uh, it coincides with the Irish famine. And so the Irish are drawn to Fitchburg and many other groups. Uh, they, we start going immediately to, to um, Canada to try to get French Canadians, as I said. All right, so I've been looking at, at those records to try to get a dialogue um, between the histories of the women whose families owned the factories who are in the upper middle class or the well-off middle class and what the lives of recent immigrants were like. And while we have a lot of primary sources, as I said, it's a little apples and oranges, uh, what I'm looking at. So I've also based a lot of this on research that's been done in Fitchburg by others. Uh, this is Joan Fenno Grammel who put together mem <coughs> memoirs by the French uh, Canadians from the French Canadian neighborhood. And then Teresa Thomas's brand new book, The Reluctant Migrants, about the Italian immigrants to Fitchburg. And then I also looked at some history of the uh, French Canadian culture using uh, these two books, uh, Peter Mook, uh, Nouvelle France, and Alan Greer's The People of New France were very, very useful. And for some of my information about the mill work that people were doing, I went back to some older resources, Amiskag by uh, Tam Tamara uh, Haraven and Randolph Langerbach, and also The Bells of New England, uh, two that I had in my, in my uh, library already. So of course, the, the immigrants come to Fitchburg out of a combination of poverty and political upheaval and sometimes starvation in their own country. Certainly among the Italian immigrants, we heard of great, great starvation and malnutrition before they came to Fitchburg. And so when I started this project, I wanted to see, well, when they came to the United States, I had heard how hard things were, and I was hoping to find what women's lives were like. And so I started looking through our records to see what they said about what women had to do. For the immigrants, I used those secondary sources that I talked about. For Fitchburg's working class women, I just looked through our primary sources, trying to see what was between the lines about uh, what people needed to do. Uh, some of the best record was actually records of the businesses in Fitchburg. So what were they providing and who did they say their, their customers were? So briefly, what I found for the uh, early uh, women of Fitchburg was that, of course, they were practicing uh, subsistence farming at home. So women had to do all the, the cooking at home. They were, um, they had, uh, even after urbanization, they had gardens where much of their family's food came out of that. And then anything that you couldn't grow, you had bulk orders delivered that you had to be ready for, like flour, sugar, and potatoes that would come in big lots. And if you were a farmer, you owned your uh, own cows and animals for meat. And that was very, very widespread. Eventually, with increasing urbanization, you had 
people didn't have room for cows anymore. Um, but that actually just changed very slowly, that people didn't have cows in their front yard. And what happened is you started to get more and more milk being delivered. I enjoyed learning about this. You would deliver it in a big can, and people would just take a dipper and dip it out as before, before things came in bottles. And of course, in, in later years, you had ice companies uh, developed and you had an ice box, this is quite a bit later. But again, you had to be there to accept delivery. And what, what came out was that you also had to be there on site to accept delivery of wood and of coal. And women were kept very busy all day long, stoking the fire, uh, taking out ashes. And uh, even after uh, modern coal and kerosene came in, you still had to keep, keep close watch over the fire. And you had to deal with taking out leftover ash or heavy, you know, moving heavy materials. So this kept the, the women very busy doing that. And of course, we all know about washing clothes, that, it, that you'd plan for all of Monday to be washing clothes. So, so as, well, let's see. There we go. Let's see. So, oh, I think I missed one. Oh, I took that out. Okay. Um, so the, so then you've got the the immigrants coming in, and they really have all the the same. It's the same setup for them, and they're used to doing this kind of of heavy labor. Um, so the, as I mentioned, they were bringing in more and more big French Canadian families, and. Uh, so um, I discovered that one of the reasons that, or I, I read in one of our books, that, that uh, one of the reasons that they really loved bringing in the French Canadians was that you, would, you were able, if you were a textile mill owner, to contract with just the father. And that would involve the work of um, the, both the mother and the children, the children too. Let's see what we have here. Uh, so there, as in so many New England towns, Fitchburg developed an area that was its own uh, Petit Canada. And so many of the records that we have here is from that Petit Canada, people that were living and working around the um, factories in West Fitchburg. They, came, they were especially uh, um, based around the Cleghorn area, where the, or Cleghorn, as you say locally, um, and, and the mills that were there. Alrighty. So now looking at what the culture was that they were bringing with them from French Canada, um, traditionally it was a f the family unit that was the economic unit and not the individual. And that structure I see in our records in Fitchburg completely continue. As I mentioned, the, they would hire the, the father and the entire family would follow. But also in uh, traditional Quebec, you had virtually no single women. The only single women that could survive on their own would be nuns. And uh, so women were working within the context of the family unit. And, and of course, what's, what is their life like as a married woman? Well, you marry early. There's no divorce. Um, you all usually have very large families because everybody is very devout and does believe in the Catholic teachings, including those on birth control. And, and so what you had in farming, when they're doing farming in French Canada, is there isn't any div division between paid labor and unpaid labor. The vast majority of the family was involved with unpaid domestic work to keep the farm going and to keep a house. Um, so part of the reason is there isn't much money flowing around for paid labor. Uh, and so also people were just using traditions of self-sufficient uh, farming. So I end up finding in Lillian Ledger's talking about what it was like in West Fitchburg for her when her family came, she said, well, they did the same things, that they had a small garden that they all worked in, and they also uh, tended to have fruit trees to harvest, so that really most of their produce during the season came from, and came from uh, what they had grown, and actually much of the year they would live from what they had canned. Uh, this was just seen as a, as a natural. Uh, and in fact, when she was looking back at the Great Depression, because people were used to not having much cash, she would say, well, those who worked, that is, those who had a job, were not much better off than the people who were idle. 
because everybody was living sort of the same. And the example that she used actually was seen from looking back from later in her life. She said, well, for example, there was no way to, to get water hot. So you, the, um, the woman had to you know, heat up the water on the stove. There's certainly no hot water taps. And so what they would do is they would heat up uh, the water for bath night and everybody would use the same bath water that night. And then actually if you had friends who found it hard to pull together getting bath, bath water and you trusted them as being good people, then you would invite them in to use the same bath water too, uh, that that was just being a good friend. And so what I've seen is in the Italian community, things were almost exactly the same. Um, they, the uh, people in uh, Fitchburg's Italian community came from the Veneto, from Northern Italy, and they generally worked, the men worked especially as agricultural laborers. They were starting to pick up some factory work, but mostly as agricultural laborers. And um, the women, of course, were very busy keeping the family fed. I, Teresa Thomas had a great description of the Italian mothers and what they had to do. She said, well, A, the house is a world controlled entirely by the women, and it's filled with hard work. She said that the women had to cook and wash for the family, also for any borders that they had. They chopped wood, they hauled coal, whichever that you had for heat. They had to heat up any hot water. There was no hot water tap. They planted a vegetable garden. They gathered greens. That was They gathered them wild. That was a traditional uh, food for them. And they took care of any animals that they owned. It was very likely that they would have a pig. And if they didn't have a pig, they would buy half a pig from the local slaughterhouse and make their own uh, sausage or salami from it. Well, there was a little bit of options for cash in the uh, traditional French culture, which was if your husband was a craftsman in Canada, it was very possible that a man who passed away, well, A, if he was a, a craftsman, the wife would help him at work as well. She'd often work side by side with him doing the same work. If he passed away, she would take over and become the miller, the, you know, the baker, the leather worker, a tinsmith, whichever, um, because she would have learned the same, the same work for him. Um, so women's lives were taken up with huge numbers of duties at home, uh, and, but they also tended to take factory jobs as well. It was not unusual. Uh, it's emphasized that we usually think of factory work as being this heavy, heavy drudgery. But actually, with the large machines and textile factories, um, it's not so much a drudgery. You actually have to move around a lot in order to keep take, uh, putting the new yarn onto the machines, taking the finished product off. And so the, uh, the women and the children worked in the same weaving rooms together. And they often had time to spend spend some time together. Even if the work was very hard and the machines were horribly loud and it was dangerous for your health, they still had a chance to relax and spend time. Actually, there's a quote from a worker named Madeleine Giguere who said, well, when the looms were running, there would be time to talk, to watch the children, to visit the children and visit in a social way. So one of the things I found is that women tended to work a night shift or the second shift so that they could work at a different time from their husband. And when they were working the second shift, often a neighbor would be taking care of the children, a neighboring relative would take care of the children, or somebody who lived in the same house with them. I didn't find records that they were actually paid, but I assume that they were, or that if they were living in the same place, it would be in exchange for room and board. It also, this also provided a certain amount of, of economic extra security was um, because if the man and the woman worked in different fields and in different factories, when things slowed down at one factory and his hours were cut or laid off, his wife's work would be continuing. And many, many people mentioned how important that was in what they were doing. Another way that women made extra money is that they took in boarders. So this meant that they had to do the wash for them and they had to provide clothing for them. Um, but over and over again, we see that this is some, a way that the working class was able to move into the middle class with the triple deckers, that they had extra rooms uh, that they could rent. And here we see a number of triple deckers in the, 
all around the uh, sk skating area in front of the church in West Fitchburg. And a number of people have come to me and said that they had homes in those in those triple deckers looking down over the skating rink and it's still it's still a great tragedy to them that the that those triple deckers have been taken down and now Teresa Thomas found that for the Italian families that they tended to actually even um, rent out a bed in a room that people that was so crowded that they would rent people or they would rent uh, beds to people all over. So of course the social safety net was the family and the French Canadian uh, stories, I see this over and over again, that if there's death or job loss, that uh, the family takes people in, helps people. One woman lost both of her parents in the flu pandemic, so she was informally adopted by another family. And Teresa Thomas found that there was another kind of social safety net in the Italian community, in addition to, to uh, the family, that those boarders who were living crammed in with you in your household ended up becoming very, very close to the family. And they would often become grand, uh, godfathers or godmothers to your children. And so it ended up that all of the boarders and the families together would create this vast interlocking network of, of support. From each other for each other. Now one thing that's different here is that we do have single women. Uh, part of it is of course we all know that the nuns were extraordinarily important in providing education and providing uh, health care uh, for, for people in these um, immigrant communities. And uh, this was something that came straight over from, from French Canada, it came over from Italy too. And in fact in the Italian population in Fitchburg, they um, provided another service, which was that the nuns insisted that in the school, everybody speak the local Veneto dialect. So it kept the contacts with Northern Italy alive and actually kept people speaking the same language of the Northern Veneto. So their, their sort of absolute control in the classroom ended up having, having that effect. There were actually also a few single women that you hear stories of, of now because of this. Okay. Um, one other way that, yet another way that people earned money is that women tended to own candy stores, little candy stores that sold to the kids, candy stores and bakeries. And so every, every reminiscence is filled with stories of being able to go to so-and-so's candy store. And some of these women would also be making money by doing crafts or doing piecework. And sometimes those were sold at the, at the candy stores. And but what this means, I'm saying, well, the kids remembered going to the candy store. So one of the big differences is that these children now have two things. They have free time because the laws have changed and they can't be required, required to work in the factories until they are mid, in their mid-teens. And, um, and some are actually going to high school. And um, the other thing is that they have cash. And so they're going to the candy store and buying a donut and buying candy. And this is a big change. In other words, they're becoming Americanized. And the picture I have on the right is of a woman who, a young woman who made extra money by doing millinery and uh, sewing for people. And you can see she is a walking billboard for the, for the work that she does. Uh, I was startled to see this elaborate, uh, elaborate picture, but it made perfect sense that this is how she makes extra money and she's able to really dress well and become really more Americanized. So over and over again, I see records that the next generation has the opportunity to go and play games in the winter. They go ice skating, they go sledding, they go skiing, uh, and do they go tobogganing on those, on those extraordinarily heavy toboggans that can go over 60 miles an hour down the hills. If you know any older folks, ask them about those. It's a really, really fun stories they have. In the summer, they all go uh, cl climbing in the woods, they all go swimming, they go exploring in the, in the old houses. So all of this is ways that the families are becoming more and more middle class. 
They're, the children are becoming more and more Americanized. English may even be their first language, certainly a comfortable language. Fitchburg is unusual in that it has elaborate Americanization classes. And so this, these generations become comfortable in the United States, whereas they originally thought that they were going to go back to Italy, go back to the other countries. They decide they don't need to. Their children are Americans. They are now comfortable as Americans. This is a uh, Margaret Keelty, a second generation Irish immigrant who helped with Americanization for hundreds and hundreds of people from Fitchburg and taught Americanization and English as a foreign language to teachers all around the world. So uh, this means that, uh, that as we, well, I just wanted to show these wonderful pictures of how this huge variety of women, within one generation, they all had such similar uh, opportunities that whether they were native born or born elsewhere, by the time we get to this, the children's generation, they are all going to nursing school, they are all getting jobs as professors, and so we really see that their opportunities merge together in one because of the, um, the American dream, the opportunities in the mid 20th century to join the middle class. And I think this is really the miracle of the 20th century in the United States. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for going so long. I <laughs> Do we have any questions or comments? Is, is the ice cream still there that was in that? It is, it's not. There's an big open space, but there's, the ice rink isn't there. It was partly replaced by a big professional ice rink that was, uh, that opened in that neighborhood and then closed uh, 30 years later. And another one that was used by Olympian athletes that has also closed and is now owned by the university. Unfortunately, that's not there. Any other? Yes, I'm sorry. You keep saying, we got this, we got that. Where I'm sorry. Where are you getting all these, uh, you know, sources? So the question is, where are we getting all these sources? It's, this is at the Fitchburg Historical Society. It is, um, we are, it's a combination of two things. One is we just opened on Main Street, so we are very, very visible, and people are coming in, bringing us things. And the other side is that there seems to be a generational shift that people who have lived in the city for a number of generations, living in a home with things from their parents, their grandparents and great grandparents are now moving and downsizing. And so they are hoping that these things will not get lost, that this history will not get lost. And so they are bringing it to us and we're rather snowed under by the quantity of gifts. Yeah, but they're very valuable. Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that's, thank you so much. <laughs>